people like me. You need people like me so you can point your f***ing fingers and say that's the bad guy. start with this. Last night, north of the border, in Canada, unbeaten Mary Spencer advanced to a professional record of seven wins and no losses after making short work of the very uncoordinated Cynthia Lozano. And this was a real knockout, not a funny looking TKO like what we saw in Cynthia's last fight with Marie-Yves Decaire. Marie-Yves Decaire, who in her fight with Cynthia at times looked Flustered. Of course, Cynthia is very wild and unconventional. Far from a textbook boxer. Uncoordinated. She lasted about seven rounds with Marie Eve D. Care. Tried that same shtick on Mary Spencer last night. Didn't make it out of the first. Short left hook mid range to inside put her down. She rose to her feet, composed herself, regained her faculties just to get stopped seconds after. Seconds in two. The first round, Marie Spencer. I told you she's the most dangerous woman in today's junior middleweight division. I'm not exaggerating. And anybody with a belt at 154 pounds has a target on their back that Mary Spencer is shooting for. Canadian boxing scribe Jeff Jeffrey provided a quote from Mary Spencer post-fight. Where Mary says, I want to face Marie Eve D. Care for the IBF Super Welterweight title. The fans are calling for this fight, and we owe this duel to boxing enthusiasts. Mary Spencer following her victory in a minute, three seconds, over Cynthia Lozano. Both Marie Eve DeCare and Mary Spencer are based out of Canada. Marie Spencer's with Eye of the Tiger Management, and Marie Eve DeCare, she's with Yvon Michel, Jim Promotions. Both have a good working relationship with Top Rank. ESPN here on this side of the border, Mary's fight was shown. It was available by way of ESPN Plus. They got a deal with Eye of the Tiger Management. They're going to be showing their fights moving forward. It's a very dangerous fight for Marie Eve Decare, who has one loss, just one loss in her professional record. Lost to Claricia Shields in what was the undisputed junior middleweight title fight well over a year ago. There's no shame in losing to one of the pound for pound best fighters in the world. It was as big a fight as you could have hoped to make at that time at junior middleweight based on the lay of the land, the landscape. This fight with Mary, however, this fight, it's a high-risk, low-reward fight for Marie-Yves Decare. There's not much in it for her. You get the sense that Marie-Yves Decare may not fight Mary until she has no other choice. I think something very similar applies to Terry Harpier, Hannah Rankin, the winner of their fight, their upcoming WBA junior middleweight title fight. Whoever wins that fight, They've got a target on their back as well. I would say Harper, and I'm saying Harper rather than Rankin, not because I'm assuming she's going to win, but this is a lightweight moving into the super welterweight division. I feel like I would like to take care of that first. You have a message for Rankin, Harper, and John this. <laughs> Each one. I'm a big super welterweight. Come on if you want to be at 154. Let's go. Mary Spencer spoke with Marie Eve Albert of the 120 Seconds podcast, the Canadian based podcast that covers a lot of action up there north of the border in Canada. And you heard what she said. If she can't get Marie Eve Decare in the ring, she wants Terry Harper. I don't want to get ahead of myself and jump to conclusions, but on the premise that perhaps Marie Eve Decare doesn't want to entertain a Mary Spencer fight right now, she has the luxury of choice, at least she does, but the winner of Rankin versus Harper. They don't. For those of you that tuned in to last night's action by way of Canada, I have the Tiger Management, you might have noticed that post-fight, Mary Spencer was awarded 
two separate vacant titles by way of two separate alphabet organizations. One was the WBA and the other was the WBC. The winner of Rankin versus Harper is going to be in possession of the WBA title. And Natasha Jonas very recently beat unbeaten Patricia Bergoult for her green belt for her WBC title. So where Marie Eve Decare might have the luxury of choice and the luxury of time. She has the option of ignoring Mary Spencer's call out. She might have that option, but those two, they won't, not for long. Mary Spencer's climbing up those ranks, those WBA rank standings, those WBC rank standings. That's what those belts signify. And the way she's plowing through her competition, advancing to a professional record of seven wins, no losses, no draws, five knockouts. You see what she did to Cynthia Lozano? Made short work of her in seconds, just seconds into the first round. Her size, her skill, her speed, her power, and her pedigree. I'm not exaggerating. This is the most dangerous woman at 154 pounds. And she is coming very close to becoming the mandatory challenger by way of either the WBA or the WBC. That's what those belts signify. The path, as it were, that she's on. All these titleists better batten down the hatches. In men's welterweight news, former WBA champion Jordanis Ugas' eyes ring return next year targets Keith Thurman, Jaron Ennis, and Virgil Ortiz. Of those three aforementioned names, two stand out as Jordanis Ugas more or less fights on the same side of the street as they do. He was quoted as saying, God willing, God willing, maybe next year. A Jaron Ennis or Virgil Ortiz fight would be less than ideal as rebound fights for the former champion. If you're talking about a Jaron Ennis fight, or a Virgil Ortiz fight, those are less than ideal rebound fights for a former champion who was stopped in his very last outing, stopped in his very last fight, and given that he's not coming back this year, that he means to come back next year, and we don't really know when, it could very well be a year's time between fights, between his last fight and his next fight. So those are... You don't fight a guy like Jaron Boots Ennis off a loss and a year of inactivity. The same applies to Virgil Ortiz. Not that I think he's gonna fight Virgil Ortiz. Under any circumstances, because Virgil ain't with the PBC after all. He doesn't fight on any of their affiliate networks and broadcast partners. He's over there on zone. I don't even know why Ugas mentioned him. He's just pulling names out of a hat. A Virgil Ortiz fight isn't realistic. A Keith Thurman or Jaron Boots Ennis fight. That makes a little bit more sense and is more realistic. And of the two, Keith Thurman for Ugas's next fight makes more sense than Jaron Ennis for Ugas's next fight. Keith Thurman, like Jordanis Ugas, is a former welterweight champion and not the most prolific, I might add, at least not these days. He's only had one fight this entire year and one fight overall in the last two years, the decision win over Mario Barrios. And given that we're in September and there's no new fight news in reference to Keith Thurman, you get the sense that that may very well be his only fight this year. That guy's career is dying on the vine. Has been dying on the vine for the last five or six years. Of the last five or six years, Keith Thurman's career, four of those years were spent away from the sport of boxing, approximately four. The two-year hiatus, or close to two-year hiatus he took after the Danny Garcia fight, and the more recent two-year hiatus he took after the Manny Pacquiao fight, the Manny Pacquiao loss. He only recently returned to action, but the way that breaks down, this is a guy who's only fought once in the last two years or so. He's only fought once in the last two years, and it could very well be a year's time between fights, depending on when he returns. That could very well be the case, as Keith Thurman doesn't seem to have a fight booked for what remains of 2022, and we're in September going into October. The year is almost out. For Ugas, a Keith Thurman fight, a battle of the former champions might make a little bit more sense than a Jaron Ennis fight. Because Jaron Ennis is a high risk, low reward. For Ugas, a Thurman fight might make more sense, and it might come with a bigger price, a bigger payday, you know, a battle of the former champions. I'd wager that neither Jordanis Ugas or Keith Thurman are in any hurry to share the ring with Jaron Ennis. I think they'd rather share the ring with each other before they share the ring with him. When it comes to Ugas, when it comes to Keith Thurman, you guys know how I feel about it. You see, Jordanis Ugas is coming off a knockout loss. So, 
It's almost a foregone conclusion that if you were to put him in there with Jaron Ennis, Jaron Ennis would knock him out just as easily, if not more easily, than Errol Spence Jr. did. I don't really want to see that. But Keith Thurman, he has since rebounded off the loss to Manny Pacquiao. He is back in the winner's bracket. There's enough time left in this year that you should and could schedule a fight between them. That's when it comes to Keith Thurman, but you don't get the sense that Keith Thurman is about to do that. And you don't get the sense that he wants to. You know that he might very well end up sitting out the rest of this year, waiting for an Ugas to recuperate, Jordanis Ugas, who was reported to have suffered a fractured orbital bone in the Errol Spence Jr. unification match earlier this year. That might explain why Ugas hasn't come back yet and why he's waiting till next year to return. Could be that, could be a lack of slots over there at either Showtime or Fox. Could be a number of things, but Ugas has made it clear that he means to return next year. And because Ugas, for Keith Thurman, is a safer option than a Jaron Ennis, he might sit out the rest of this year. He very well might. If he does, the way it might break down is, I don't know, maybe Ugas fights Thurman. Winner of the fight goes in there with Jaron Ennis. Jaron Ennis, who so far has only boxed once this year, just once. That was back in May against unbeaten Custio Clayton, an Olympian who represented Canada. He boxed two times last year, only once this year. No news of a new date. A new fight date, though there still is time. It would be an awful waste of time if that's the only fight Jaron Ennis ends up having this entire year. Jaron Ennis, who should not be confused with being one of Al Heyman's boys. He should not be confused with being a PBC fighter. While he does fight on the Showtime platform and while he has appeared on some pbc cards he himself is not a pbc fighter but he needs a big name he needs a signature fight and at some point these former champions they're gonna have to share the ring with him danny garcia has already fled to the junior middleweight division where he's fighting welterweights he very recently rebounded off the loss to errol spence jr from well over a year ago against jose benavidez jr won a decision and that's likely going to be the only fight he has this whole year but he's out of it keith thurman and ugas they're still campaigning as welterweights in the welterweight division so I don't know, you get Ennis a keep busy fight, let those two former champions settle up with each other and let the winner. Let the winner make the winner. Fight Jaron Boots Ennis. At some point, Showtime has got to flex some muscle and get Ennis a signature fight. Because while Al Heyman may not be invested in Jaron Ennis's career, Showtime is. And Al Heyman gets his budget, at least a portion of it, from Showtime. Sacrifices have to be made. And one of these former champions needs to be sacrificed. That's the way it is. And finally, more of the same in men's heavyweight news. Get a whiff of this. Deontay Wilder is open to Anthony Joshua fight. Manager Shelly Finkel says, and it's the funniest thing. Ahead of the Usyk rematch, it was Shelly Finkel who said he'd be interested in doing Joshua versus Wilder, even if Joshua loses the Usyk rematch. Eddie Hearn reaches out, gets no response. Deontay Wilder himself confirms that Eddie Hearn did in fact reach out, and in so many words, what he said was, we're busy. Here comes Shelly Finkel saying the same thing again, saying Deontay's interested. Is Deontay interested, or are you interested? If Joshua needs to take a break and take a fight as a comeback fight, or if he feels the real redemption is with Deontay, we're open to it, I'm not close to it, I would never just walk away from it, Finkel told the son. You did walk away from it. When Wilder rejected the hundred million dollars from the zone on top of rejecting four or five other offers before it, you did walk away from it. You did that already. And more recently, you wouldn't even respond to Eddie Hearn's phone calls or emails or however it was he tried to get in contact with you. Your fighter confirmed he did try to get in contact with you and you didn't open up a dialogue to at least start talking about the fight. It obviously wouldn't have been the next fight, but you have to at least start the conversation, open up a dialogue to get the fight off the ground. I told you this was going to happen. I told you they'd resort to the same old tactics we saw in 2018. Shelly Finkel was quoted as saying, Joshua was gutsy to go right back into the fight when he clearly lost the first one, but it really depends mentally on what Joshua feels he needs. The potential fight is gaining some traction in weeks as Wilder and Joshua promoter Eddie Hearn have traded shots through the media. But first, Wilder has business to take care of in the ring against Robert Hellenius on October 15th. Right now, we have one fight on our mind and nothing else, which is Hellenius, said Finkel. And if that were true, you wouldn't be talking about a Joshua fight. But you are, aren't you? Because if he doesn't do what he's supposed to do with Hellenius, the rest 
doesn't matter. You think I got something against these guys calling out Anthony Joshua? I don't. That's the name of the game. That's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to call him out. You're supposed to pursue a fight with him, but is that what you're doing? Is that what you're really doing when his promoter reaches out to you so you can start that dialogue? You don't respond to his inquiry, don't respond to his calls or his emails or however he tried to get in contact with you. You basically blow him off so you can continue to talk about his fighter and your fighter ahead of your fighter's next fight. So in a nutshell, Team Wilder's talking about Anthony Joshua. They're still talking about him. Tyson Fury spent the last three days harping about him. Expecting people to believe that you can negotiate a fight that size in full view of the public eye based on call-outs over social media. Over the course of three days with a 24-hour deadline, and there are actually people stupid enough to believe this guy, stupid enough to believe that that's how you get a fight done. While this talking about him, Fury's talking about him. The guy literally just fought. He's coming off of two consecutive losses, and all these other guys can do is talk about him. In some ways, it's the only way they can really get attention for themselves, because Fury's focus really should be Usyk and only Usyk, and tuning up en route to Usyk. He shouldn't pretend he can make a fight with Joshua before this year is out based on videos he uploaded to his social media. That's not how big fights get made, and everybody knows it. Hell, the only reason he stopped is probably because the Queen died. Queen Elizabeth II second very recently passed away and i think it would have been in poor taste for tyson fury to continue his public shaming his quote unquote campaign to fight anthony joshua before this year is out you can't garner the collective populace's attention at a time when a crisis like that takes place so that's likely the only reason he's not still uploading videos to his social media but he'll try it again once all this blows over he'll find some other reason to keep bringing up that guy even though that guy ain't got no belts and he's coming off for two back-to-back -back losses. You, you're the reigning WBC champion, unbeaten. What do you need with Anthony Joshua? Why do you and your team and your fans keep trying to find ways to bring him up? Why is Team Wilder doing the same thing? I'll tell you why. Because in victory or defeat, belt or no belt, here today, Anthony Joshua still is the cash cow of the heavyweight division. Team Wilder knows it, and Tyson Fury knows it. For all the spin jobs performed when it comes to Deontay Wilder, and all the guys who want to prop him up as the greatest thing since sliced bread. For all Tyson Fury's talk of being this division's lineal champion, the unbeaten WBC. Blah, blah, blah. You still need this guy to get paid. No man born from his mother. Blah, blah, blah. You still need this guy to get paid. There's only one! Blah, blah, blah. You still need this guy to get paid. You still need him. Because enough people, enough people, they don't buy into your gimmicks. Enough people don't buy into Tyson Fury's shenanigans, his antics, and his gimmicks to where he's got the Midas touch. No, he ain't got it. He can box. He can box. He can box just fine. He's a very good boxer. He ain't got the Midas touch. There's something about Tyson Fury that rubs a lot of people the wrong way. And we talk about it all the time here on the channel. And it's that he is a bit of a con man. He is a bit of a shyster and an opportunist. And so's Wilder. 